Ron Millward is a guest recommended by our friend in the Producers Club, Kim Wood, uh, part of the veteran community who wants to talk about veterans' health and wellness. He is also behind balancedveterans.com. Balanced Veterans, their mission is to create a safe space for the education, empowerment, and advocacy of alternative therapies for veterans. We partner with professionals, businesses, and other organizations to support veterans and their families in living a better, more balanced life. Now, as a veteran, a combat veteran who's dealt with PTSD myself, uh, as, as, as a pundit, as a, as a journalist talking about COVID-19 and, and concern about what everybody's experiencing right now, as someone who has done everything I think reasonable to, to get uh, my fans and audience to know that yes, there are 22 veterans still at least committing suicide every day in this country. That is an underreported number uh, that there are a lot of things that just don't get counted as suicide. I mean, when a veteran, uh, you know, drinks himself into a stupor and then wraps his car around a tree because he's hopeless and goes, well, I might as well die tonight. Pretty sure that should be counted as a suicide. Not, as, not even if it's an accidental suicide, whatever you want to call it, there's a lot of that in the veterans community, and especially right now with COVID and lockdowns and shutdowns and a whole new dark cloud over the world. We are seeing some disturbing numbers where a lot of <clears throat> veterans who are on the edge are just getting pushed over it right now. A lot of the lifelines that were keeping veterans from committing suicide are not functioning. And I know this myself, having gone to the VA at, at several times in the last in the last few months going, I better stay away from this place. And I know that for some veterans, that's how they feel every time they go to a VA, anything, anytime, anyway. So, uh, you know, Ron, I'm, I'm really grateful that you especially right now are able to have a strong voice in the conversation and and do what you do for veterans of course i think we got to start with what's your what's your military resume you know name branch uh, uh name branch mos <clears throat> service number uh social security the uh, serial number of your weapon what, what, whatever yeah. you think the typical veteran bullshit. what if we didn't do that you know <laughs> uh but no, yeah no, but you know no, I know, I know. We want, I know, we want to, to to get past militarism, but I just, what is your common experience? <laughs> Absolutely, man. I've I've got you. I give that little elevator pitch all the time. But no, I'm an Air Force uh, veteran. Believe it or not, combat. I had deployed hey, with the hey, army. Hey, hey. Now, oh hey, hold on. Get me back on screen, CJ. See, that's why he didn't want to talk about his veteran status. He's in the Air Force motherfucker talking to two marines here oh oh it's not important it's not important what branch we were in we're all brothers we're all brothers just because i was in the chair yeah no okay. there it is there it is chair force right <laughs> hey i actually have a, a special hello from mike whiter he told me to tell you hello he's basically my neighbor we hang out quite a bit and uh, i just wanted to wanted to say hey but yeah man um I was an Air Force veteran, uh, deployed with the Army, uh, did did my stint, but, you know, uh, eight and a half years, uh, and I got the E-5, got out, I voluntarily separated, um, but, you know, I was completely mentally messed up, as a lot of well, people are, you know, well, the transition. What was your experience? Yeah, so uh, I was in Iraq in 2010, uh, running convoys with the, with the Army, uh, so basically f supplies from Kuwait through any base, all the forward operating bases in Iraq, we, we hit them all. Uh, so, you know, IED, small arms fire, all that yep. crazy shit. Yeah. Um, no, uh, hold on. I, I want to back you up on this one, Ron, because, uh, you know, I I think people understand that a lot of this teasing is just that. But uh, and, and there's 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 good reason for it when we're talking about the Air Force. <laughs> but no, I was I was in Fallujah in 2004. Oh, and, cool. you know, I was a Marine in a combat zone. Oh, well, you were civil affairs. I still get shit. Like, yeah. if you weren't infantry drinking blood every day in combat, <laughs> someone's going to say you weren't doing enough. But yeah. when I was there, and I was truly in the shit, Fallujah, 2004, first battle, and some people, some people make fun of me. Oh, you were in the first battle of Fallujah? Not the second. Well, that's not the <laughs> real bad. battle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, God, okay. But, yeah, there, there were Air Force dudes deployed legit in combat doing pretty much the same shit we were. So it's not at all... 
uh, you know, something that you should discount. Oh, he was in the Air Force. He didn't get real combat experience. No, there, there were Air Force dudes. And it's dumb. It's, I'm not saying this makes sense. I'm not saying this is good policy or military organization even or taxpayer dollars well spent. But yeah, there were Air Force guys who were really boots on the ground. Yeah, no doubt. There are quite a few jobs like that. And, you know, to be honest with you, I think that a lot of that and a lot of the qualifications that happen in the veteran community are like what may need to die. And I'm not saying that altogether you've got to lose your identity, but, you know, I, I meet a ton of veterans. I talk to a lot of vets and usually the first thing that we talk about is the qualification. Where were you? What'd you do? How much, you know, How like, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of that stuff. And, you know, it's great. But like, I, I really want to know where people are at mentally because, you know, you mentioned the suicide epidemic, right? 20 to 22 veterans, add in active duty, yeah. add in family members, add in the re the ripple effect in the families that happen after a suicide. Man, you're looking at more like 30, 35, maybe even more. Who knows? We don't have the numbers. They didn't include California in the in the yeah. statistics. There's a lot of things that are really left at, at question. Like you said, other things that how other people pass away, not classified as suicides. So it's extremely alarming. And like, I've, I've lost way too many brothers and sisters to it. And, um, you know, it's a part of why I decided to launch Balanced Veterans and we don't want to be another voice, man. There's a lot of people talking. Everybody's talking. Everybody's got something to say. Try this thing. Do this book. Trauma has really, really become a way for people to create profit off of. You know, I think that as soon as, as soon as we see that there's a problem, people come in, they try to create the next self-help, the book, the thing, the whatever. Um, but man, I, you know, I briefly listened into your last guest and, and really related and loved what he said about the meditation and really getting into yourself and figuring that stuff out. And so, you know, that's the narrative we're trying to change. You know, we come in and the military is very hard. It's very hardcore driven, you know, uh, very masculine. It's very, very power heavy and um, really deconstructing that because I don't think that as humans, that's necessarily the normal state for us to live in. There are people that are, you know, called to maybe do more and things like that, but really transitioning back out of the military, I think is going to help save more people than, than any of these dumbass programs that they're putting into place and all of these mm -hmm. millions and trillions of dollars they put behind whatever initiatives they're putting out next. I mean, I think it really gets down to how are people really doing mentally? Let's strip the bullshit away. Let's strip away the titles. Let's strip away everything you've worked for, everything that you've created and where are you really at? And, um, you know, so we're, we're starting to try to have that conversation in the veteran community. You know, we hit a couple walls and, and I get made fun of and people talk shit all the time. You know, this is a brutal world, but I don't care, man. Um, I hope that, that by whatever we're able to put out, you know, we put out this video about making tacos, something to interrupt your life. How do you find balance in your life? Well, let's, let's make a quick recipe and maybe it'll be fun for the veteran community. And, you know, a ton of people received it. Some people made fun of it, but we're going to keep doing it. You know, I want to interrupt. I want to interrupt the messiness and the, the, the traumatic, all the bullshit. You hear it. There's a lot of noise. We want to interrupt that with some, some really healthy stuff, hopefully. Now, Ron, before we get into the specifics of the programs that, that, that you're working on, I do want to point out the truly inclusive nature of the veterans community and that we struggle with that inclusiveness because we have been conditioned to play dick measuring games. And one of the groups that is most disadvantaged by this is women in the military. And what unites us, first off, by being a veteran, is that uh, you were, what, you can say we were duped, but one way or another, you made the conscious choice to sign an enlistment document or commission document, whatever. Fuck the officers, right? We're not, when we talk about veterans, we're not including officers. Fuck Never officers. Face, right? no, no, RVP's okay. an uh, officer, but fuck him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no, but when you sign, when you sign kidding, up Derek. one way or another, you are putting your, I, I hope people realize that when we, we, we there's the, the, this other fun part of the veterans community is this mocking of. Very sarcastic. Itself. We are just kidding. I love you, Derek Carver, my vice president, who yeah, is an yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is over the top, like macho jockeying locker room humor bullshit. But back to the women, because this is so important. I want to say what, what unites us really, whether you're, you know, whether you're in the Army, Navy, Marines, even the Air Force, uh, even the Coast Guard. 
Uh, you know, <laughs> you sign up. <coughs> Space Force is a thing now, so get oh, ready. Space Force, no, no, fuck that shit. No, that's not the military. But uh, no, if you, <laughs> what what you're doing is is putting your life on the line for the government, with the understanding that this government can spend your life on behalf of this country. That's the mm. that, there's. No, no matter what your interpretation of that is, whether it's honorable or naive or, or you know, whatever, selfish, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because what you, that is what unites us, is that you were willing at one point to put your life on the line for this greater national cause. And for some of us, it was you know, with a global consciousness. And what you do when you enter that world of the military, when you cross that line, when you sign that line and you cross that line into the world of the military, uh, as you pointed out, Ron, it's it's an environment, uh, a militaristic regimented environment that promotes violence and competitiveness mm. and machismo and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, I, I mean, I hate to say toxic masculinity, um, but for the, to, to whatever extent that term is legitimate, we got it in space and women in the military are in that same environment mm. and in many ways they have it worse they are more vulnerable in that environment and a lot of them have experienced combat i remember beginning of the iraq war why why did why were we so enthusiastic about taking out saddam oh jessica lynch he killed the, he he hurt one of our female soldiers how dare he you know but that's not how the military operates. I mean, if the military was as mad at commanders who who, who rape subordinates, mm. we would we would see way more change in the U.S. military than we ever saw in Iraq. It's it, it, it the the misdirection of angst towards the external enemy as opposed to the internal one is particularly obscene when you understand the breadth of the problem of military sexual trauma and it's not it's, it's primarily i mean there, there are plenty of other instances of there are gay people who infiltrate who commit sexual crimes as well um there there are female commanders who sexually abuse male subordinates but clearly by and large the trend is male officers or <clears throat> senior enlisted using rank and, and power to sexually abuse female subordinates. And it is a whole other kind of trauma that women go through. And I just want to make the point that especially when we're talking about something like balanced veterans, we are especially uh, conscientious and, and making a deliberate effort to make sure that women and all victims of military sexual trauma are acknowledged and represented. And I don't know if you have better numbers on this, but as I recall from my days in activism with Iraq Veterans Against the War, it was that one in three women in the military will uh, will be raped at some point, uh, deliberately, se not, maybe not raped, sexually assaulted, uh, but I I'm pretty sure that every woman, woman in the military, at least when I was in, experienced something inappropriate because it was, it was normal. Yeah, man, I'm so glad you're talking about this. Uh, it, it's actually, it's obviously it's everywhere. It's all over the media with the Fort Hood issues and Vanessa Gillian, you know, I, all of the stuff that's happening. Uh, you know, uh, we've got a, a member on our board. Um, her name is Julia Thompson. She's been advocating out in California for Vanessa Gillian and, and military sexual trauma and um, shares her story openly about the same struggle. She was a, a combat veteran <clears throat> deployed to Iraq and, and struggled as well. And so there are uh, there are so many stories that are unheard of people that are coming out. And, and here's the thing, we're hearing a lot about some of these women that are coming out and that is not discredited. This is incredibly sad. This needs to be changed. I walked into the Philadelphia VA last week and they had flyers everywhere. Uh, they had these little things on the table inside the dining hall that said um, cat calling is not acceptable that, you know, different sort of things for people to understand to sort of break down years and years of what, you know, we thought were acceptable. The old man walking around the VA. Hey, hey, pretty lady. Hey, honey. You know, like all the things that like you think you grow up and they're normal and it's acceptable, but it's really not. And so I think now, like changing that narrative, having that conversation and being more open about it is big. I've been in on a ton of different conversations about people starting organizations to help military sexual trauma victims and things like that. But what 
I have been surprised by are for all of the women that come out about this, there are so many men that have also experienced military sexual trauma that won't even mention it, that won't even talk about it, Harder that are to struggling, admit. that it's even, that it's even this whole sort of hidden life that they have that has really crept into the identity of everything that they touch and they're not sure why things aren't changing. I'm talking about the PTSD. I'm talking about all the other stuff, but like there's still this dark passenger that people aren't talking about. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's it's a huge, huge issue that now is being addressed finally. And hopefully we continue to talk about this. And the more people tell their stories, the more people are openly going to, you know, Fort Hood needs to be looked at. There's some crazy shit going on down there. And and luckily there are there are people that are investigating and looking into this. But it's not just Fort Hood, man. It's everywhere. It's every base is experiencing that. I saw that when I was in. I'm sure you did. Yeah. Well, you know, Ron, about some of this, there's there's a there's an, a, a kind of dangerous intersection with PC culture going too far, saying don't don't say this, don't say that. And I I'm I'm generally on the side of. You know, no, be flirty. Don't take shit seriously. Let's be fun and casual. But the one thing that I do want to really underscore, and this is so important in this conversation, is that when you're a commanding officer and you do it to a female subordinate, it's not just flirty. Yeah. There's there's a power dynamic that needs to be acknowledged. And, and, it, and it really needs to be acknowledged in every situation. And then I think we can sort out what's threatening from what's not without just this blanket let's be paranoid of anything that's you know remotely flirty uh right. because that can have i think i think you know i don't want to sidebar on this too much but i think you know just hanging up on the language or no cat calls ever you know that yeah, yeah. no I, I i get it man and and like that's that's always the tension like I, i've listened to a few of your talks and i love it man i love that you just go you know and i i think that that's like in my mind i think that's that's like you know, it, it's acceptable. It's acceptable to do those things. But then when like somebody's going to be offended, you know, like it's 2020. And like, I feel like every time I post something, somebody's offended. Every time you say something somewhere, somebody's offended. And so, you it's know, you're right. We, the internet. It's just, bots it's, just the, it's just the internet. It, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually, it's remember, um, we saw this. I'm sorry. This is a fun sidebar though. You'll appreciate it. it. Like a, during the 2016 election, there was a Russian troll farm exposed where the russian government was hiring hundreds of people to just spam russian propaganda and wow. random sideways comments and they actually made a protest and a counter protest happen in america with these russian trolls they're able to manipulate that physical reality and given wow. how much the u.s government spends on propaganda and the fact that it was i think about a decade ago the military put out a contract request for sock puppet account software, where they wow. could have one person control multiple accounts. So when you get on the internet, this I just have to give this as like general advice for everybody. Remember, nothing on the internet is real. <laughs> you got to check your sources. But when you get on the internet, you have these conversations, Ron, especially with a sensitive topic like this. Half of the people on the internet could really just be a hundred people in an NSA troll farm who get paid to spam shit all day long. Wow. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely yes, yes. right. And, and and even if that's not what you're looking at, when you're talking about any kind of sensitive issue, you got drunk people, you got stone people, you got tired people, you got a lot of stupid people, you add in the trolls, that's over 90% of the internet. <laughs> What's real on the internet is, is like, eh, it's, it's a small It's a little bit. <laughs> okay, oh, so Ron, fun. Ron, back to the serious issue, though. Um, you, you do a, a lot of work with medical marijuana. I fucking hate that term all of a sudden, but uh, <laughs> cannabis for, you know, for being cannabis. What's, what's the deal? Why is this important? I th didn't we talk about this already? Haven't we figured, why is it, are we, have we not? Why are we still talking already? about this? Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great question. I don't know why this, this uh, plant is so hated. I really don't get it. Actually, we do. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of money at play. There's a lot of politics at play. You get that. And so, 
You know, I, I've been on these calls weekly. They're actually quite annoying with advocates all over the nation where we're talking about, hey, how are we going to take the hill and, you know, get cannabis legalized for veterans, right? Like everybody's excited about it and we're trying to brainstorm ideas and come up with ways to do it. And, you know, it, the fact of the matter is I, I don't really know what it's going to take for there to be change. We've told the stories. Weed for Warriors went and smoked on the steps. The civil disobedience was done, right? Like th that way was taken. We went the story route where we went and we educated politicians and we showed them the benefits you see people thriving in communities you see people all of these things like it's there it's it's a, i'm medicated right now and you know what i mean i think that like the more the more that we can break the stigma down the more that we can live our lives and be authentic while showcasing that hey this is the medicine that we choose you know it helps i think that it's a general population i think that it's it's a change in mindset that a lot of people have. I've, I come from Amish country, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. And where you go home, there's a very different view on medical marijuana, cannabis, than there is just an hour away in Philly where it's decriminalized and you know, you're gonna get a ticket for smoking on the street. In Lancaster, you're gonna go to jail. Like there are, there are different, there are differences just an hour away. And so it's really like people just not understanding the actual benefits of it. So that's part of what Balanced was. We, uh, Balanced Veterans, we started to partner with um, one of the larger dispensaries in the state of Pennsylvania to provide education for people. So we're doing these veteran education series where we say, hey, some of the common alarming issues that veterans face, here's how CBD, THC, uh, all of the different components and compounds found in the plant, which people just think, hey, it's just weed, it's just cannabis. Man, there are so many different compounds that turn this thing into a really, really multi-tool of a medicine. And so trying to educate on how to use some of those things like for sleep and for anxiety and PTSD and some different things. No, it's not the cure. It's not the fix for everything. Um, we really think that incorporating a lot of other things is important and that's the the the, what it takes to live a balanced life. It's not just one time, one thing will fix it all. Uh, but yeah, cannabis, I, we're still talking about it. There are still people that are in prison for this plant. And, um, you know, this is going to be a, a long conversation uh, along with other plant medicines that are, that are radically helping people. So, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take for, for people to understand that there, this could be a major tool in the suicide epidemic, in the common veteran issues, to, to be able to gain more access to this plant. I think a return could really help, but, you know, I can sit here and wish all day. And uh, Well, I, I wish we would just have a simple statistic of the veterans who do commit suicide, how many of them are cannabis smokers versus the veterans who don't commit suicide. Yeah. And I, I think uh, pretty obvious, right? I mean, just to be able to show people in that, you know, with that kind of decisive mm -hmm. number. But there's there's obviously a lot more to this. And I, I think as, as big as cannabis is, there's a deeper issue of community and isolation right and and it's the, the veterans who commit suicide you know aren't the guys who are hanging out at their uh you know vfws or american legion posts or you know you know going to peer support groups or even listening to an interview like this and i i would hope that if there are any veterans listening that this makes you feel a little bit less alone to to have you know a few vets talking here of course we got you know we got jim and cj joining us as well but, uh, and, and anybody in the audience, I think this would be a great interview uh, to take some questions from the audience on. So if you guys have questions for Ron or me or about veterans in general or anything else you want to point out to help strengthen the community, put them in the comments. Jim Freedom will get them up on screen here in just a few minutes. Before we get to that, uh, Ron, I, I want to go back to COVID. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the virus which shall not be named so that we don't get censored on YouTube. Wait, uh, but no, I want to. <laughs> yeah, right. The, the this dark cloud over over the world right now, um, that is, you know, like I said, the, the thing I think that contributes to veteran suicide most directly, aside from the military experience, it's the isolation that uh, a lot of vets experience when they come home. Um, part of it is having an experience that their families don't relate to. Part of it might be having an experience that they're ashamed to bring to the veterans community for being judged, uh, like I said, especially, you know, MST victims. But 
right now I have been hearing, uh, you know what I want I want to give I want to give some credit to someone specifically and and, and share something uh, very important and this is just a random thing that I got on on Twitter actually and it's it's really uh, not often that I, I even get to you know, reference something that's that's kind of behind the scenes like this but I this is I'm not even going to say who this is from this is just an anonymous person I met on Twitter send me a message. The amount of suicidal ideation calls I get from vets is really high and rising. Mm. Like, wow, okay, who are you? So, oh, geez, what's happening? He said, so I can't talk about this publicly or I will lose my job, but I take notification calls for the VA. When a vet goes into the ER at a non-VA hospital, when I started, I would get one or two suicidal ideation calls a week. Now, I get two to three a day. Jesus. And I'm just mm. one rep out of a few hundred. Now, I can't verify this, but I don't have any particular reason to doubt it. If this is an insight into how much worse things are getting for veteran suicide right now, and no one's talking about this, it's not being reported. You know, people are, are, are the mainstream media is so busy denying that there are any consequences to these, you know, ever loving government lockdowns and shutdowns for our own good in the name of a virus with a lower mortality rate than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis, just as an example. Uh, but I, so I, I wrote back, oh, fuck, wow, anything else I should know about this? Any public numbers? And uh, this person wrote, some of the rise in numbers is due to the fact that the VA is actually doing really good uh, coordinating care right now. There's a genuine effort to improve the system and that is leading to us catching suicide attempts before they succeed. But if attempts are up this much, successes will be up too. I just can't prove it and I'm not willing to risk my job and my family's security. And I mean, just just that in and of itself, wow. that we that the, the, the bureaucracy that is there to take care of veterans is still a government fucking bureaucracy yeah. that hides mistakes faster than it exposes them. And an individual like this in this situation <clears throat> has to say, I can't, I can't even speak out. I can't even call attention to this. Um, so he says, uh, every week I'm helping veterans maximize their benefits and get the help that they need and getting paid pretty good to do it. I don't want to risk that. And it's like, well, yeah. fuck, the government is stealing from the rest of us as taxpayers, stealing from the rest of the world, from the American military empire that has allowed mm. uh, us as citizens of the empire to enjoy the fruits of so much applied economic leverage. And and it's like, oh, yeah, you've bought he's, he's openly saying the government has bought my silence on this. Wow. I, I can tell you that when I talk to actual vets about about it, they are telling me that the lockdowns are the biggest cause. Some of them also say the protests are causing mental health issues. Most complaining about people kneeling which i think we both agree is a shit reason to be upset but whatever and i and i get it if you if you don't have the perspective to untangle that and all that flag means to you is the thing that covered your buddy's coffin and mm. and and the president says well they're disrespecting the flag yeah okay you're going to be upset it kind of kind of makes sense so <clears throat> um uh, what do you what do you make of this ron i mean does this is this, is this in line with what you're thinking <laughs> one to two suicidal ideation calls a week up to now two or three a day i mean if you go by week that you know just 14 a week versus two a week a, a seven-fold increase being conservative based on these numbers is and it, is is it one that rep. bad right now this is one rep out of he said hundreds or they uh you know whoever that is thank you so much for what you do and you know, I, that mental confliction is real. I was on a meeting last night where somebody that's high up with the VFW, oh, shoot, I don't even know if I can say that. Whoops. Rewind that. Somebody high up with an organization talked about some other things that were going on that were really shady as well. And the same sort of thing applied where the, they were being bought for their silence. And that will be exposed. That will be come out. You know, veterans don't play around, right? So we can do it for so long. We can see that there's some, <clears throat> some messiness happening. But at some point, somebody's going to come out and say some shit because... At the end of the day, that suicide epidemic is not going to stop by these these organizations doing what they're doing, right? Like there are some major veteran organizations collecting millions and millions and millions of dollars doing absolutely nothing to help actual veterans or do anything boots on the ground, right? So that was another reason why we came in as a as a liaison. We have no affiliation with the VA. I've got no affiliation with any sort of government agency.
agencies other than the PA Department of Health. They know we're very active, what we're trying to do to help veterans. And so, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in D.C., we're at the Capitol, we're doing things, we're in the public, but there is no real affiliation to anything. And so that's on purpose. We want to be able to be a safe zone for veterans to come to. I've got veterans that come that were kicked out, that have no benefits, that are that went and served this country that did something stupid because of the repercussions of the mental health that happened with that, get kicked out and are denied benefits for the rest of their lives, but are completely yeah, messed I, up. For people who aren't veterans, who don't understand exactly what Ron said, I do want to explain that a little bit, is that this is a very common situation where someone is deployed with the military. If you don't think about this, if you go, oh, well, you deploy, you come home, right? No, 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 you deploy, you go back to regular active duty yeah. with PTSD. And then instead of the military acknowledging that they fucked you up or that your experience fucked you up, they just expect the exact same behavior and conduct out of you. And if you go and have a drunk driving incident or you get in a fight with your NCO or you you smoke pot because you were at a party and you heard all these things or you're desperate and you really needed something to cope or you, you turn to some other drugs or chronic alcohol use. They don't go, Oh shit, you shouldn't be in the military. Let's go straight to medical discharge and, and 70% PTSD disability approval. They go, Oh, well, fuck you. Let's, let's kick you out and say that you're worthless, bad conduct discharge. And now you don't get any benefits. Right? Yeah. That's what you're yeah. Why would we continue to pay for you? You know that, and that, that, unfortunately, that whole right there, what you're talking about going, deploying, coming back, we are learning from the time that you sign, whatever paperwork you sign and you process into any military branch, you are starting to learn to suppress emotions. The government is training you to take every emotion you've had, suppress it, and go on and complete the mission. We've got something to do. Whatever that looks like for whatever unit you're with, wherever you're at, however the government chooses to use you. And so we've still got the suicide epidemic because we've got a bunch, a bunch of people that are still suppressing emotions. That have still not fully understood how to deal with some of those emotions outside of the military, outside of... Okay, now I'm no longer identifying myself as a as a soldier, as a whatever you were, and now you are just a person that really and then you realize like, wow, we are just a bunch of people trying to figure out how to live normal lives and and it doesn't go so well. And then you see people committing suicide and that's the easy way out, right? Like all of this mental confliction, it's just way easier to just end the life and not actually confront that stuff head on. My heart yeah. fucking breaks for people that are in a spot that literally, and I heard you say this on your suicide episode, thank you for saying it, for people that can't hang on, just hold on. Like your situation is not so bad that you need to end your life. Like you can legitimately change your entire situation. Now there will, there may be repercussions, but you can change your entire situation in 24 hours. Leave what you have going on. You may lose a job, you may lose a home, you may financially have repercussions, but it's better than losing your life. It's better than yeah. you taking your life. And so, man, th this suicide epidemic is not ending. If anything, this isolation, like you said, one of the number one things that I think does drive somebody to that because you are so disconnected that there's not even anybody there to be like, yo, you're off. There's something odd. Why are you being, you know, you're not around any sort of community for anybody to see any sort of uh, warning signs and you just continue to perpetuate in your own misery until you don't see anything clear other than the perspective that's in front of you. Yeah, you know, there's one thing that I, I left out in that suicide episode and the specific message to veterans. So <clears throat> if you allow me now, Hey, assholes, if you pussy out and kill yourself, don't think I'm going to change one little bit for your bitch ass. I will find you in hell and make you do monkey fuckers until you poop. Okay, yeah, you little bitch. <laughs> so, uh, so, Ron, if you have this, uh, let's go to the comments. You know, for, for our audience here, I want to make sure that they have a chance to ask you questions. We always have a lot of veterans uh, and, and actually a surprising number of active duty guys. Love in it. our audience and uh see uh jim if, if you want to jump on and, and maybe tell us about you know what the conversation in the chat is right now and and you know read some of these comments on screen for us please uh pretty uh at oh i was muted sorry uh we don't really have any comments per se directed at either one of you everybody's uh pretty invested in listening i think it's a hot topic Topic and I think people just don't know what to say about it, <laughs> you know. 
But any Deep Vincent questions? W I mean, says so. No, I, I don't have any questions. That's what I was saying there. I put on there, if anybody has any questions, to use at Ron or at Adam, and uh, we'll get their questions put on live, but nobody's taken advantage of that yet. Uh, the only thing I can see that has anything to do with the subject is D. Vincent W. who says, my pop opted out November 11th, 1982. He was WOC3 first cab in Vietnam in 65 through 67, and one cost of vet suicide is their children. Dad was Winter Soldier 1972 against war. He's the reason I'm not ex-military. Mm. So, I mean, at least mm. that's, you know. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. No, there's, yeah, no, and, and I, I want to just connect this to, you know, the, the, the biggest picture I can here. And I, I don't want to, you know, bring too much of my politics into this conversation to say, you know, if you're a veteran, you must eventually become a libertarian because that's bullshit. And that's not helpful for this conversation. I think a lot of people, you know, are tempted to do that. But I, I do want to point out that what what D. Vincent W. just shown a light on right there is that addressing these issues, being able to come out of your military experience and say, well, this was good and this was bad. Let's fix what was bad. Well, gee, when you're talking about the military, the bad is death. The bad is people dying unnecessarily. The bad is humanity held back by militarism, by governments using violence to protect their power, and out of corruption, negligence, fraud, waste, and abuse, killing people and letting people die unnecessarily. And if you, if you kill yourself as a veteran, you're robbing the world of the chance to learn from your experience and to help move mm. past this. And, you know, about what you said, Ron, about, you know, we are conditioned to suppress emotions. In, in, a, in an operational sense, that's a great thing. That's so positive. Right. That's emotional maturity, self-control, and, and so on. But when it, as you described it, I think it's fair to say it's a broader conditioning of suppressing emotions. And in that sense, militarism is directly opposed to compassion. And again, regardless of your politics, you get out of the military, you put down the militarism, you pick up the compassion. And this is how we move humanity forward. Well, Generally. the other thing, and I know there's a great question here that I, I definitely is awesome. Yeah. But the other thing is when you go into the military, like I went into the military at 17 years old. So like, you're, you're 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 learning to be a man. You're learning to figure out what it looks like, and and honestly, it's not always the most healthy way to like construct that sort of early adulthood per se, right? It's 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 really it's made some some folks that took that freedom and were able to just run with it. You know, it, it can make us a little bit crazy. I'm gonna say that there are some crazy ass veterans that I have, am friends with, and myself included, right? Um, like I think that I think that that is. That just looking at that, just understanding how your military career did affect you, it, it's it's extremely devastating when people take that suicide route. But like, dive into yeah. why it affected you, and if it wasn't your trauma, maybe it was something in your childhood. Maybe it was something something else that has you where you are. Don't always attribute it to the military. I think that 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 sometimes is the easy scapegoat. Well, I've got PTSD, yeah. so this is why I am the way that I am. Yeah. All right, I got, I got to take advantage of this opportunity to make fun of the Marines before we get to Chris Cole's very important question. I couldn't there. do it, but you because, can. Oh, yeah, you couldn't. I would kick your ass. Uh, <laughs> airman. Uh, <laughs> no, but in, in, in the Marines, we have more than our share of short and gay people because the Marines is where you go to prove yourself. We also have way more than our share of insecure people just going to prove themselves. And to your point, Ron, if you join the military and you don't already have a strong sense of identity, the government will be happy to issue you an unhealthy one. And to, uh, to Chris Cole's question there, Chris Cole is a longtime activist with Victims of Family Law. And that's everybody who's been through a fucked up divorce, or mm. child custody, or been a child of divorce, or had their kids taken from them. They're obviously, family law is an issue that is very swept under the rug in America today. And Cash Jackson, our friend who's a veteran, a Navy veteran, 
in uh, in Chicago has been a very outspoken voice on this, having his kids taken from him uh, by a family court, appealed to the president himself directly in person, still hasn't gotten his issue resolved. And I, I can't imagine uh, that that's not a confounding factor here for veteran suicides, that if you're a veteran, you come home with PTSD, not only are you dealing with all the inherent issues with that, but if you've got a wife and kids, and now you're failing as a husband somehow in their eyes, and your wife says, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna take the kids. Not gonna be helpful. Uh, Ron, are you seeing an intersection with this in your work? Yeah, yeah, that's, it's major. I see a lot of uh, actually caregivers that are abusing veterans' rights and taking benefits and things like that. And so there are a lot of, there's a lot on both of those sides. I've, I've met, uh, folks that have had their kids taken away, different sides, either the the husband or the wife, right? Like go through a nasty divorce and, and both sides. So I, I think that obviously that adds to the traumatic experience of the whole situation, but um, understanding really why that got to that situation is important. Like I think being able to have representation by somebody like Chris to be able to say, hey, there's mental health at play. Let's understand what steps we could take to resolve this like we are like i think that most people are afraid to get the help that they need because they're like oh that's going to result in me losing my kids that's going to result in me losing everything but i think if you're from the beginning able to say look something's not right i'm being a shitty father husband mother whatever that looks like and being able to confront that and know that when you get the help like it's actually going to be better for you it's going to look better for you in court or however that plays out like the fact that you did need to get some help you took the time to get some help and you're going through the the proper steps to to do that but a lot of times things get too far right there's like something crazy happened he's punching holes in the doors like the kids we need to go Right. So like it's already gotten to this point where it's like that's no longer safe and like they do need to be removed from that situation. But then the veterans left spinning because they're like, that's all I had. That was literally the last thing that I had. And now it's completely gone. And so they feel like there's no, you know, no other option. But it, there's always an option. And I think that even in that darkest, darkest spot, having the words, Chris or whoever's dealing with people like that to be able to say, hey, look, like this looks bad, but it it's not, we're going to get through this. You know, we're going to figure out a way to move forward. Um, what did he, he just sent another part yeah. to it. Jim, you want to, well, let's, let's get Jim back up here. Jim, you want to read that one out? Yeah, last I can read that. It's Chris Cole again. It's a follow-up from his super chat. He says they can take your retirement, disability, and more through mm -hmm. alimony and child support. People get PTSD from family law, Vic's law. Many never saw combat cashed in wow yeah 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 i mean imagine just the trauma of having your uh, there's so much trauma associated with with government ripping families apart and there is a huge intersection with the veterans community let's get cj on stage too here <clears throat> to, to wrap this up uh you know jim cj you guys have any thoughts or or critical comments you want to share to you know help what we're doing here to strengthen the veterans community even with yeah, this, this conversation I, uh... I did, Ron. Uh, how you doing? Uh, I was checking out your website. Great website. Highly recommend it. I'll pitch it for you here for everybody, so uh, you can we can get it on the screen here. But uh, you know, I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, you know, what are your guys' thoughts on red flag laws when it comes to veterans? Because that is the most common tactic used. And if you think about it, who's the most likely person in this country? to speak out against government, speak out against rights violations, constitutional violations when they see them. And what weapon does the government have in response? Red flag laws. So I was kind of interested in hearing your guys' take on red flag laws and veterans. Yeah. I think it's pretty obvious that it's one more thing that suppresses people from getting care. Simple as that. Absolutely. You know, and if, you, if, if, you're, if you own a gun for self-defense, and you're capable and handling it properly and safely. But then you go, you know what? Uh, I'm feeling a little suicidal because of my you know, military experience and desperation. I want to go talk to someone about it. Well, you got to give up your gun first. Fuck that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and just real quick to add a point to this, though. Um, I like taking guns first and then going to court to get the due process is quote from Donald J. Trump. Yeah. 
So what I'm yeah. really finding a hard time believing is that there's so many patriots out there that can hear 22 veterans a day are committing suicide, that these red flag laws are targeting veterans a lot of the time in these local courts, and yet they're supporting a president that doesn't mind taking guns first and then going to court to get due process. So that in of itself is a deterrent to veterans to seek the help. The court system, i.e. the family court, is not providing you jury trials to convict you of crimes, to give you substantive and procedural due process of law. They just take your rights and then you have to appeal, costing tens of thousands of dollars. You lose your rights, your children, everything. Uh, and, 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 and we, I don't question why 22 veterans a day or more are committing suicide. I don't. R idiots do. But, but at the end of the day, uh, as a veteran, I can assure you that your service is used against you. And so when people say thank you for your service, to what extent are they really thanking you? Because your government surely doesn't. Your government treats you like you're the expendable meat sack for their corporate wars and their, their, pharmaceutical contracts, oil contracts, you name it. So why do we, like you guys said it in this interview, why are we still talking about this? It seems to me like it's a <clears throat> perpetuated, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to explain, but it's perpetuated through the fact that when a veteran commits suicide, there's a profit to it. And, and that's where I believe that there is a cottage industry of, of veterans that are or groups that are taking advantage of the fact that they get involved in the court systems, they get involved in mental health systems, they get involved in the government, and, and then the government turns that against them, and now we see the suicide rate, the homelessness rate. So, again, these are all rhetorical statements. I get that, but I, I, I'll just end my thought with, I don't, oh, by the way, here's a, here's a good one for you. I've ne a veteran standing on a bridge, and he pulls out his cell phone right before he contemplates suicide, and he sees somebody doing a 22 push-ups. He still jumps. Your push-up videos don't help. Stop virtue signaling. It's not helping. You're Yo, no I do push-ups, bro. <laughs> no, do your push-ups, but stop virtue signaling. It's not helping. And yeah. that's all I've got for today. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there Mic drop. <laughs> there is certainly an incentive to promote veteran suicides because every veteran who kills themselves saves the VA money, which saves the government money, which is more money that they have to spend on child sex trafficking. Wow. That's a way to think about it. Whew. Heavy stuff. You know, and I, and I, I go that route. I mean, I, I, I hate to say it. I hate politics. I just do. It's, it's just so divisive for people. Right. Because especially now everything's a shit show. Right. And, and I, I am actually, I'm exploring libertarians. I love, I, I've loved a few of the things that you've said. Um, and so I'm, I'm pumped to look into that more, but I, I, I sort of, you know, I look at it like, okay, so I'm a service connected disabled veteran, right? So there is a financial gain for me to be in, you know, and, and different legislation changes that. And, and so trying to protect that, like, you know, I, I think at, at the end of the day, like I'm in that system now. You know, like if I don't comply or I don't do something, they can take my benefits, they can shut us, you know, whatever that looks like, right? And so you're, I am trying to get my mind outside of like what we're talking about, how it's like as soon as you get out of the military, you are now in this industry and, you know, the government's paying for me. And as soon as I would commit suicide or not be here anymore, that's a lot of money for the government to get back. Never thought of it like that, but wow, that's eye-opening. It's really eye-opening. Well, Ron, I, I will say one thing to plug my politics here, if you will. Uh, um, with, with, with libertarianism, it really is anti-politics. I think of politics as the societal argument over who to point the guns of government at to organize society. Because taxation is theft. It's backed up with the barrel of a gun. The drug war is backed up with the barrel of a gun. If you do a drug government doesn't like, men with a gun come and lock you in a cage. The good things that government do even are supported by this fundamental violence and coercion behind the system. And the entire message of libertarianism is stop. Fucking stop. Yeah. Stop pointing guns. No, like, who do we point? You know, if politics is the question, 
I mean, there are a bunch of people in America going, should we point the guns at them like this or at them like this or at them like this? And libertarians come in and say, fucking stop. Stop pointing guns. <laughs> we're, not, we're, we're not really politicians. We're not really doing politics. It's, it, it really is a sort of transformational anti-political movement. And, and I hope that, uh, that, that a lot of the veterans, you know, by the way, we have, I will say this, as long as we're talking everything that we're doing in this conversation, uh, we have more than our share of veterans in the Libertarian Party compared to the other two political parties or any other political organization I've been in. And it's not because we're more civically engaged. It's because so many veterans are compelled away from militarism by their experience and militarism you know war is the health of the state it is the ultimate application of government violence and we say you know what that was bad you know for me the experience of coming home and joining iraq veterans against the war was realizing it's not enough to be against one war yeah. it's not even even enough to be against the global war of terror it's not enough to be against the military industrial complex it's not even enough to be against militarism itself but statism this hmm. fundamental belief that it's okay to use violence against individuals if government says it okay says it's okay or there's enough public consent and people vote for it democracy is fundamentally evil not democratization not decentralization of power not voting or including people in decision making but democracy is a government system of the majority coming up with an excuse to force its will on the minority that's yeah. straight up evil and libertarians are going in saying, no, don't want to do that. So anyway, I don't I don't want to sidebar anymore on, on the bigger politics. I want to end with something a little more positive. And and a couple of things that, that that I want to say about this is that I think we are we are way overdue for a veterans-led revolution in this country. If the troops defended freedom, they'd attack the government that is constantly destroying our freedom. And maybe when you're stuck in the system, you can't see that. But there are more veterans than active duty fuckers in this country today. And if you guys try to stop us, we will fuck you up. There are more of us than there are of you, son. If the veterans in this country and y'all trained us, yeah, yeah, you bet your ass. We train you on active <laughs> duty right now. You bet your ass. If the veterans in this country rise up and say it's time to say fuck the government, fuck this system that treats us like this you're not going to stand in our way. You're going to stand down, boy. And that's what's going to happen if we get what's really coming to the government in this country, veterans standing up. And maybe that's just, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe we're not there yet. I don't know what it would take. I'm ready. I've been, and it's got me motivated to do everything that I've been doing and all the civil disobedience that I've done. But if every veteran in this country joined you and me and saying at very least, we're going to get involved and we're going to stand up like this. No, we're not going to let ourselves be isolated. We are not going to fall for the VA policy of deny, delay, and wait for us to die. Fuck yeah. that. We're going to get involved. We're going to yeah. step up. We're going to we're going to apply the real virtuous lessons that we learned from the military. Is that when you see someone in pain, when you see a fellow veteran, when you see when you see your brothers and sisters in arms suffering, you don't just let that shit go. When you yeah. see an injustice in the world, you don't just ignore it. You step up and you do something about it. And you know what? I think this is really important because this was for me. The ultimate thing that saved me from suicide was having a sense of purpose. Yeah, no doubt. That man, wow. You one, thank you for educating me. You just told me a bit there about libertarianism. Thank you. And then two, thank you for what you just said. I, I think that purpose is everything. And if you don't have a purpose, make your purpose other people. Make your purpose helping other people that are, uh, you know, being, being, really martyred for this country to try to to try to create change for people to actually live with with some sort of thriving instead of dying um i think that i've been in some of these zoom calls man with some movers and shaker veterans around the nation and i think it is the time i think that people are stepping up and they're realizing that there is a lot of power in the veteran community and we do have a voice and so i'm i'm grateful to be in this conversation i'm grateful to know you now and to have had this conversation and i think that it's just from here on out really continuing to to voice what matters and and stand in the face of injustice for sure so one one more thing, Ron, I, I, I got to point out about myself as an invitation to you is that, you know, I live here on 
11 acres in the mountains of Arizona. And one of the things we'd like to do is to be able to develop this property into a space for veterans retreats. And if, uh, if you, uh, we, we've got to talk offline about this later, but uh, I, I hope that there are other people who can find that sense of purpose in their lives. Most immediately right now, I want to end, Ron, with this positive question. What's your best advice for veterans amid this, I should say amid this, amid this coronavirus pandemic, no, with this crowd of bullshit, fear and paranoia and economic suppression and isolation hanging over all of our heads? What, what's your, your best advice for, uh, for, for vets who might be feeling uh, a bit isolated, right? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, slow down slow down and breathe. There is a lot of stuff flying at us from the media, from politicians, from everybody that's talking. I think that it's time for us to really slow down, understand that there is a way to move forward. And I think that you figuring out what that is, our normal was interrupted, um, you know, and maybe that pushed you to a more isolated spot and you've got to fight against that, but really figure out what you need to do to move forward with a sense of purpose and direction. If you're sitting still and you have no direction other than the Netflix show you're going to watch tonight or whatever you're going to do, you're just living inside of what we were meant to be created to do by the media, and that's to just consume, consume, consume. I want to encourage people to interrupt that consumption and just think about what really matters in life and really find something to care about. And hopefully you realize that you've genuinely got to care about yourself and you have to love yourself because no one else is going to do it for you. Beautiful. Well said, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a perfect note to end things on. The website is balancedveterans.com. Thank you, brother. Thank you for your service, and I'm grateful for all you do, man.